time management and we are back on time. So then I would like to move to the third block of this webinar, which is on transit and COVID-19. And we start with Thomas Kopp and Elena Dugunji from CWI National Research Institute for Mathematics and Computer Science. Thomas is all yours. Hi, do you hear me? Yes, clearly. Okay, hello. Um... My name is Thomas Koch. I am a fourth year PhD student with CWI, the National Institute for Math and Computer Science. Um, I will briefly present my work on uh, determining the effect on door-to-door -door travel time of the lower public transit frequencies in the timetables that uh, were as a result of the pandemic. As discussed by previous speakers, um, the pandemic has led to a rapid and significant decline in demand for mobility and especially for public transit. In the Amsterdam area, we're looking around a minus 55% decline compared to the best baseline if we look at the Google uh, mobility data. Um, secondly, it also has reduced supply as there are disruptions due to absent staff, especially in the early phase of the pandemic and additionally, um, social distancing and um, additional cleaning of vehicles has led to less vehicles being in service. So as discussed also by previous speakers, this has led to uh, service cuts by um, in public transit. So the level of service based on travel time is really See, see it by pattern where we can um, divide it in different components. So first you have the walk to your first transit stop and the walk from your last transit stop. There's the time you spend in the vehicle and there is a uh, transfer time between vehicles if you need to transfer. But secondly, as no transit timetable will always fit your agenda, there's always some wait time involved you need to go earlier away from your house to be on time for work. There needs to be a slight buffer time. And if you're done with work, you walk to the bus stop and you need to wait for the first bus home. What we saw in the pandemic in the Netherlands that operators usually just reduce the services um, by the frequencies on each bus line. So usually that was Sunday level. So instead of like four times per hour a bus, you would get one bus per hour. But the, the, the time in between stops um, would remain the same. So as the bus lines largely were still there, you could still walk to the same bus stop. You would still spend the same time in the vehicle. But if we look at transfer time, you can see either an increase or actually an improved transfer time as transfer transit schedules now fit slightly different into each other. But the biggest difference that we see in this level of service is how much you need to spend time waiting or adapting to this new timetable. So this is something we want to look uh, more at. So in, we use something from the literature called the rooftop method where you basically just look at all the departure options. And here we see the plot of uh, an example where you can get from your origin to your destination in around 50 minutes. So that's your in-vehicle time. And we have four different options. We have an option exactly at the entire hour. We have one at quarter past, all 45 minutes. So if you arrive exactly at, your, at the departure time, you will have a travel impedance of 15 minutes. But if you arrive in between two services, you will have this additional wait time. So if you plot this figure, we can define the level of service as the area marked here below the average. So if we look at a different example where we increase the frequency, we can see that the wait time has decreased, thus reducing the wait time in between services and increasing the level of service. If we look at another example where suddenly we still have four buses per hour, but we lay them down in a more irregular pattern. So now we have a service at zero, zero, and a service at 10 past, a service at 30 and 40. So if you arrive in between, if you just miss the bus at zero, you have luck because now you 
only have to wait 10 minutes instead of 15 minutes. But if you miss the 10 pass circles, you now have to wait 20 minutes. So you can see that the irregular pattern as a whole for the hour decreases the level of service. So then we get to our case study. Um, so what first, what we did to define addresses, we door to door, we defined addresses. We took the, the registry of all addresses in the Netherlands with all buildings, and we randomly but weighted, randomly selected these addresses, but weighted based on sort of their importance. So big buildings like shops, universities would get a higher weight and selected. Secondly, we try to get a geographical sp spread around the zone by making sure that each address that we selected from a zone would be 200, meter, 200 meters separated from a different zone. Um, sub subsequently, we use these addresses to calculate the travel time from those 7,000 others to we sampled to all the other addresses. And we did this for three two-hour ranges where we defined the rooftop method level service with. And we did this for multiple days during different phases of the pandemic while the Francis ghetto were slightly scaled up back up again. Let me get to the next slide. Yeah. So um, here we have plotted the results of the difference between the travel times in February and in June of last year. So in June, basically we rescaled all um, the schedules back up, but we reduced the metro frequencies while keeping bus frequencies as they were before. So if we look at the figure on the left, we can see that from this location next to the metro station, basically all around the metro stations, the travel time in vehicle time largely has remained the same. But on places where you need transfers, we can actually see a decrease as now the bus connects slightly worse on the metro network due to the reduced frequencies on the metro network. But if we look at the difference, if we apply this rooftop method, we see the effect of this longer wait time in between frequencies. So you can see a big difference here for the metro network where if we just looked at in vehicle travel time, we would have missed that people from this location around the network, metro network would have longer wait times. So we also see that in some places, the travel time has actually increased. So this is basically where suddenly the schedule in this area, of the, the connecting network to this area suddenly fits slightly better in this reduced schedule, which might be surprising, but it's very logical. Uh, we made this tool completely interactive so you can click on a zone and get the different results but i'm running out of time i will be i would love to show that if anyone wants it in a different setting so my conclusion that i want to give is that service cuts can affect travelers in different ways and they might actually improve some service cut may actually improve the life of some travelers but more importantly, that computational power and new transit routing algorithms make it possible to conduct way more advanced accessibility analysis. So, thank you. And um, are there, if there are questions, they can be emailed to me or uh, addressed via Facebook or anyway. So thank you. Thank you very much. And actually, you were perfect on time. So we even have time for quick questions. If someone likes to ask a question now in the plenum, um, we, we have the time to ask the question now. Well, it was a very clear presentation and very clearly showed what the impact is if single bus line is simply cut back because the frequency is reduced, how much more difficult it might be to connect. Thank you so much, Thomas Koch and Thank you, no problem. for this research, for this research. Appreciate this very much. All right, good. Then I would like to move on with Ronak Basu, who is from the MIT, who's talking about transit recovery strategies. All right, um, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, that's great. All right. Um, 
Good morning, afternoon, evening, and night uh, to all of us, uh, everyone who's joined us for this uh, session. Thank you, especially to Rolf and Ng for organizing this with a wide variety of speakers. This is a really interesting um, couple of sessions put together for the workshop. So this talk is going to be about uh, a few ideas on how we can use new mobilities for post-COVID transit recovery strategies. And this is um, joint work with uh, Joe Ferreira, who's my advisor and who's also on the call. So jumping right into it, um, so I'll give you a little bit of background of how COVID has affected life and most of us are living through that. So it'll be brief and then a dive into the pre-COVID trends within the Metro Boston area. That's where we are looking at. Uh, that's in the neighborhood of MIT. Um, we'll show you some trends that we've observed uh, that quantify COVID-induced impacts, especially on mobility perceptions and car ownership. Um, some challenges that we foresee um, for post-COVID transit, and then propose a few strategies using new mobilities on how to move forward. So you've probably seen these numbers and you're tired of numbers or numb at, at this point, but it's worth iterating like this is probably the worst event that has happened in the living memory of most of us on this call, uh, especially for the US. So the US has 4% of the world's population, but 25% of COVID cases and 20% of deaths. Uh, more than 10% of the workforce in the US is uh, still claiming unemployment benefits. And obviously we have cascading cases of evictions, food security, and mental health. Now looking at uh, Metro Boston in particular, so the area was already highly auto dependent to begin with before COVID. More than 90% of households had a car. Um, the car commute rate was greater than 90%, and it had been ranked the most congested city in the US by mobility consulting firm INREX twice in a row. Um, drivers lose over $2,200 per year. And to put that into context, that's way more uh, than what minimum wage workers make. That's actually close to what grad students make per month. Um, and overall, the lost hours and congestion was costing Boston's economy over $4 billion every year. Now, if you look at these uh, trends sourced from the American Community Survey, you'll see that uh, private vehicle ownership was on the rise in Boston. Uh, pre-COVID. So starting out from 2005, we look at uh, the number of households without cars, that's the black dotted line on the bottom, and that has remained largely constant. And you look at households with at least one car, and that shows a steady rise. And we've dug deeper into these statistics, and the big gain here is happening from households who own two or more cars. So we see some transitions uh, from one to two cars or from two to two plus cars, and that kind of gives you a sense of who's living in the core of the metro boston area who can afford to live there especially given the new luxury developments that are coming up now transit ridership was on the decline before covid as you can see from these figures over here so we've looked at different modes uh, or transit services so you have commuter rail you have heavy rail light rail and bus and this sharp precipitous drop right at the end is because of covid but if you look at long-term trends since 2002 especially for like the commuter rail and the heavy rail. So the trends were sloping downward. So transit wasn't doing too well. And that obviously has uh, implications for revenue and the service uh, of, or the quality of service that transit providers uh, can offer. Now, how has COVID changed or induced um, perceptions towards transit and cars? And what does that mean for future car ownership and transit use? So when we look at the effect of COVID on transit ridership, so you can see here um, the y-axis is percent change from expected transit use. So what would have happened in 2020 without COVID? And then we compare that to what's actually happening out there using um, ridership statistics. Now, obviously, like we saw the sharp drop, right? Uh, in March, as a lot of businesses were uh, businesses and offices shut down and people started working from home. So at, at the worst point in April, uh, transit ridership was 85% below expected. And over the summer, um, we had some recovery, but since then it has largely remained stagnant at around uh, 65 to 70% below expected. And um, I haven't had the chance to update this figure, but um, I've looked at the numbers and even now, like, 
even for January and February, it's still at the same stage. So we don't see um, a, an easy way of uh, inducing transit recovery and obviously work from home policies and, and um, potential for increased car ownership are going to challenge uh, the return to transit uh, even more in the coming days. Now we've had the opportunity to do a few surveys as well within the area and um, as well as do an intercity comparison between Boston, Singapore and Mumbai, just to get a flavor of what's happening out there internationally and can we generalize these trends that we observe. So these are a bunch of um, uh, statements that we offered uh, the respondents within the survey and they had to uh, rate it on a Likert scale from strongly disagree to strongly agree. So I'll just highlight a couple of these. Um, the first one, uh, looks at a statement which says, using a private car can reduce COVID transmission risk. Um, now you look at the difference between car commuters and non-car commuters, 77% of car commuters, and these, these are all weighted sample shares, um, agree with the statement that yes, uh, using a private car can reduce COVID transmission risk, but uh, a much lower percent of non-car commuters, only 69%. So that's a difference of eight percent points agree with the statement. We also see a huge difference in these in the perceptions for transit between these two groups. For example, when you look at the second statement I've highlighted here, public transit is currently unsafe. 72% of car commuters agree with that. Now, they mostly commute by car and they could have been using transit for non-commute trips as well, but this is a little surprising and, and it's a little rich coming from them, especially um, because I don't imagine they're using trans transit quite as frequently as non-car commuters only 61% of whom agree with this statement. And that's again, a difference of 11% points. I won't go into the other statements for in, in the interest of time, but we can come back to that later. Now, we also wanted to understand how COVID affected car purchase intentions for zero car households, basically households that did not have a car pre-COVID. So we asked this question, has COVID-19 enhanced your intention to purchase a car? And this was, offered only to zero car households. Again, a Likert scale question or statement uh, ranging from strongly disagree to strongly agree. And we find that on average, 18% of all households um, agreed with this statement that, yeah, they wanted to, or COVID-19 had enhanced their intention to purchase a car. 45% of all households were on the fence um, and they weren't able to um, provide a, a strong opinion. Now you look at Transit commuters, the numbers are a little higher over here. 21% as compared to 18% agree that yes, they wanted to purchase a car. Um, there's also a difference on the flip side within strongly disagree. So 39% compared to 37%. Um, so, and not as many people are on the fence right in the middle. So it shows that like you have um, choice transit commuters who are thinking about purchasing a car because they can afford to, whereas those who are dependent on transit are unlikely to be able to purchase a car and there's less um, of a choice happening right in the middle. Now, we followed that up by asking a question about the timeline. So if you want to purchase a car, how soon do you want to do that? Just to get a sense of when we can expect an increase in car ownership and what that means for congestion within the region. Um, so we found that 26% of all households intend to purchase a car within one year of our uh, survey date. And that's roughly consistent with transit commuters. That's 25% for transit commuters. But you look at the next um, category over here, one to two years. So that's 46% for transit commuters compared to 40% for all households. So it seems uh, clear to us that transit commuters are waiting to see if transit providers can offer reliable and safe services before jumping into this decision. So a lot depends on how we choose to uh, strategize transit recovery in the coming days. If we are to prevent um, transit commuters from moving uh, to a car commute. And what are the challenges for post-COVID transit that we can infer from uh, the, these surveys and results? So the primary challenges that we've identified are crowding risk on public transit. So Twitter has been ablaze with a lot of um, pictures and a lot of discussions on how people aren't wearing masks on transit and there are crowded buses and the service frequencies are inadequate. So that's something definitely 
to uh, look into. Then obviously, as we highlighted, the perceptions of mobility options, especially towards transit. Now, uh, we've also looked at the car purchase intentions of zero car households. We know from previous research that car ownership and use are particularly sticky elements of travel behavior, which means that once they purchase a car, it's unlikely that they're going to be using transit as frequently as earlier. So you'll see increased car use and in a place which already had a very high level of congestion where over 90% of households and individuals use cars, that doesn't bode well in terms of future prospects. And we've also um, highlighted a little bit in a paper, which I'll allude to later on, I, I don't have time to present it here, about the substitution effects of ride hailing services. So uh, our civic partners have uh, done a survey in the last couple of years looking at the use of uh, TNCs or ride hailing services in the region. And we find that they substitute uh, transit and active travel, especially within dense urban core areas. And, and that's concerning for um, the sustainable outlook within the region. Now, how can we move forward using- Can we emergency? need to wrap up and stay on track here? All right, yeah. Um, so in terms of near-term and longer-term strategies, we have identified a few. I'll just skip over this and jump straight into this. So we've, we uh, looked at bike sharing and how that feeds into transit, and we found significant and measurable effects on auto ownership and auto use. So the effect is around 3% per household in terms of reducing auto ownership in the proximity of bike sharing stations and 3.5% uh, uh, on reducing BMT per individual in the same neighborhoods. And we've recently um, been granted uh, an NSF Civic Planning Grant where we try to design a mobility as a service pilot experiment that kind of focuses on enhancing the accessibility of lower income and essential workers and allowing transit providers to focus on mass transit where you can maybe cut down on a few lower demand routes and offer alternative methods. So these are the two uh, papers that we've uh, published this year and you can refer to these for details. And with that, I'll um, end my presentation and open the floor for questions. Please feel free to email us uh, if I can't answer them within this session. Well, thank you very much for the presentation. Super interesting research you're doing and it shows us in this discussion whether impact of COVID-19 will be long-term or only temporary, there are these effects like car ownership that might lock in some behavior that is more long-term than many of us had anticipated the travel behavior changes of COVID-19 would be. All right, to stay on time here, I would like to move on to the next presentation. So discussion please shall happen either on the Facebook page, in the chat, or by email directly to us or not. Thank you very much for the presentation. And next, I would like to go to Hashao Khan from Tongji University, who's talk about the rail transit passenger in COVID-19. are you there? Yes. Great. So if you'd like to start the presentation. Yes. Uh, so it's, it's a bit mute. Um, now I can hear you. You need to click. Okay, good. Up so, uh, but how to share the screen? Uh, well, uh, he is not uh, co hosted. So, uh, Rolf, could you make a co host him? Oh, okay. My mistake. So now it should be possible. You should have a green button in the center. Okay, yes, 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 yes. Yes, now we can see your screen. Okay. Uh, 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 thank you for giving me the opportunity to, uh, to talk about the, uh, uh, the survey of the Metro passenger before and during pandemic in Shanghai. And uh, uh, we have conducted a survey and uh, how people work during the lockdown time. Uh, even the lockdown time, we can find still uh, have a 30% of the, these people uh, that have to commute every, uh, every day because they have to maintain the, the fundamental function of the city. 
So, and we uh, we look at the the model model split change uh, uh, before and and uh, and after. Uh, we can find the uh, the uh, if for those people who have to work uh, and uh, who take metro still quite uh, stick on the metro. So it's uh, because of the total passenger uh, reduced. And uh, uh, and the the metro is uh, brand new, so uh, uh, for my experience, people are not uh, so much worry about the uh, uh, the, the infection uh, during the travel. And the uh, the uh, uh, the activity in the city uh, really shrink during the lockdown time. If we compare. Uh, the the uh, the uh, tra travel origin distribution in January and also in in April we can find that in April is uh, is uh, quite uh, uh, expanded but uh, in January is a uh, is a uh, uh, very uh, uh, shrinked uh, and also the high concentration activity uh, 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 lot of uh, uh, concentration activity actually quite uh, uh, well supported. Uh, by the metro, uh, by the metro network, but still some cannot be uh, supported by the metro. And this is uh, the the daily uh, passenger flow of Shanghai Metro uh, to in the uh, uh, Spring Festival. Uh, we can find that it, it's almost a, a one week festival. Uh, it's a, it's around uh, twenty percent, even ten percent of the total total passenger. This is uh, the uh, daily passenger of uh, 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 Metro Line Two in in uh, April, and there's still a big drop. And also uh, during the weekend, suppose uh, we have uh, more people uh, for the for the shopping and the recreation, but uh, it's a, a, a big drop during the weekend. And we also uh, 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 study the correlation. Uh, 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 in in the spring festival of 1920, uh, uh, 29 and uh, 2020, we can find the uh, the station passenger the relationship of the of the two year is almost the linear. So it means when when a, a station have more passenger, uh, the the impact of the uh, 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 COVID-19 will have a imp uh, big impact for the bigger station. But it's a, this is a surprise to us. Uh, suppose it's a, not a linear one. And also if we, we uh, look at uh, the distribution of the metro passenger from, uh, uh, from the city center by uh, uh, in the Chinese New Year, it's also a big, bigger shrink. So uh, a lot of uh, uh, activity ac actually become trend. And also this is uh, the, uh, in, the, in the Apple uh, uh, in 2019 and uh, 2020 in the financial center. So the, the, uh, the influential area of, of the financial center uh, also shrink. The, so we compare the the passenger flow uh, of uh, 2019 and 2020. Uh, we can category uh, to, we can category them to to four type. Uh, for uh, for for some uh, they have a high uh, passenger flow and a high reduction rate, especially for those uh, in the city uh, city center. <coughs> And also uh, this is for the uh, Apple, so the almost the same uh, uh, same pattern for the for the uh, passenger uh, change. And we also have some uh, the surveys show the the travel time uh, re uh, travel time change for commuting. So this is the survey we conducted in uh, in March in uh, uh, twenty twenty. Uh, we can find some of for some people really uh, uh, have time uh, more time uh, uh, for commuting 
but a lot of people still uh, almost keep the same same time for for commuting, and we also can dis disaggregate this uh, by by different uh, travel modes. Okay, uh, thank you. This is uh, the uh, sum of the observation uh, of the uh, the, uh, the travel for the people. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Aisha, for this presentation. And I realize in Asia it's getting really late, so I appreciate that you are hanging in there and giving the presentation late in your day. But we do have participants from Australia who are still here in this webinar, so I appreciate, even though this timing is very inconvenient for someone in the world, you're still here and participating. Thank you very much. We have a few minutes for one or two questions for Michelle. If anyone would like to raise a question here in the plenum, please go ahead. Well, Hashal, I would like to ask you a question that is, yep. do you have an indication how the um, passenger numbers are recovering? Now, as COVID-19 is overcome to a large degree in China, how are passenger numbers recovering? Uh, uh, yes, we, we compare uh, 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 Shanghai and Guangzhou, the recovery uh, the rate uh, seems to be Shanghai is uh, recovery is good than in Guangzhou. So. Uh -huh. But different city have a different uh, situation. Uh. Okay, yeah. Thank you. Any other question for Hashal? Okay, if not, then I would like to move on, last but not least, to the presentation by Mattia Bossati from Bocconi University. Mattia, are you there? Yes, yes, I am. All right. Let me. Okay, can you see it properly? Yes, it's an presentation mode, very good. Okay, so uh, first of all, thank you very much for this invitation to be still here for uh, the last presentation of, of the day. Um, today I'm going to present this research paper that basically deals with the relationship between uh, uh, the spread of uh, COVID-19 and transit usage in Italy. This is a joint work with uh, Silvio Nocera, professor at U of University of Venice, and Marco Percoco, professor at Bocconi University. So, as we said so far, uh, several governments impose uh, restrictions and containment policies to reduce the spread of COVID-19, um, such as restrictions on public transport. And we know how in the long run these restrictions are imposing uh, serious challenges to uh, the economic sustainability of many transit services. However, so far, the empirical evidence shedding light uh, on the role played by public transport in spreading this new disease is very limited. So the aim of the paper is to contribute on this ongoing debate by testing whether places in which commuters were more prone to use public transport were also uh, more severely hit by the first wave of the pandemic in Italy. Um, so to test this relationship, we uh, measure the spread of COVID-19 by considering excess mortality, which allows to overcome major endogeneity issues related with uh, official COVID data. And uh, we rely on administrative data that provide for each Italian local labor market the uh, daily number of fatalities occurred in the 2020 and the average daily number of fatalities occurred during the 2015 and 2019 years as a baseline. So our dependent variable for this study is this mortality growth that basically takes into account the burden of the disease as a deviation from a pre-existing trend. We are able to observe excess mortality from January to June of the last year, so both before and after the most critical part of the pandemic cycle, which was around March and April, at least in Italy. And uh, um, as concerns mobility, we rely on data from the latest nationwide mobility assessment that was conducted during the last census in 2011. We measure uh, transit usage as the share of the population who commute by 
public transport for work or study reasons. Um, then we control for additional factors what may be important in uh, explaining the spread of COVID-19. For instance, commuting, so overall mobility. To do so, we compute these two simple indices where internal commuting uh, measures the share of the population working or studying in the same area where they live. And on the other hand, external commuting is the share of a population that basically move to and from an area still for, uh, for work or study reasons. And consistently with uh, uh, the literature in, in the field, we include uh, geographic, demographic, and economic controls to capture other important factors. Uh, to formally uh, test this relationship, we employ the following econometric model, where we are able to exploit the panel dimension of excess mortality. However, as you notice, we are using mobility data all the time, so all our uh, explanatory variables are time invariant, and this is, very, this is the reason why we interact all of them by um, a full set of month dummies. So, in other words, by excluding the month of January as the pre-outbreak period, all these uh, coefficients, so beta, omega, eta, and, and, uh, and gamma, uh, should capture the differential impact of these covariates in explaining excess mortality over the different phases of a pandemic cycle, as expressed by the different months. Uh, as usual, we include um, unit and time, fixed effect, and we cluster uh, standard errors. Uh, jumping quickly on results, the rationale of, of, this, of, of the table is to provide uh, four different specifications where uh, controls and fixed effects are progressively included in the model. And uh, um, I'm reporting here for simplicity just coefficient associated with uh, um, March and April, so when uh, uh, Italy was severely affected by the pandemic. As you, as you can immediately notice, all coefficients associated with transit usage are not statistically significant throughout all the columns. Uh, conversely, coefficients associated with the internal and external commuting are positively and strongly correlated with the excess mortality, and the magnitude of these coefficients uh, is decreasing uh, throughout the column, which means that by including uh, control variables, we are able to capture important part of the variability. In the paper, we provide some robustness checks to corroborate these empirical findings, uh, as well as some uh, quantile regression to check any variation in this coefficient over uh, different quantiles of excess mortality distribution. Um, so, to, to conclude, uh, without the sake of giving a causal interpretation, uh, this uh, empirical evidence, we are, we are provide some um, suggestive evidence of a statistically weak association between uh, COVID fatalities and transit usage. Uh, in particular, we suggest that the places where transit was uh, more widely used were not severely affected by higher excess mortality compared to uh, other parts of, of the country. Uh, what it seems that what matters most is whether people move rather than how they move. Uh, but it, it is important to clarify that with this empirical analysis, we cannot rule out of a, pos of a possibility of virus transmission occurring on public transport, which is uh, a different research question and which is act out of the scope of this paper. So um, thank you very much for, for your attention. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Mattia, for this presentation. Very interesting. We do have time for one or two questions, if someone likes to ask a question sure. in the plenum. Um, Rob, I see you typed a question in the chat. Would you just like to read the question loud? Sure. Uh, so my question is, um, you know, is there a spurious effect, basically, that maybe you're measuring what people do at their destination? So if they're going to work, and are in an enclosed space? No, uh, we're not able to observe this difference. We are just using uh, origin destination data from an old matrix. So we are just analyzing mobility patterns and the structure of a community network. But we are not able to disentangle uh, we, which is the destination, so what kind of place. Okay, thank you for, thank, thank you for your question. 
maybe along the same lines, I was wondering, could it, be, so you show the transit usage has an impact, but could it be the transit usage also serves as a proxy for a certain social demographic groups? So could it be that maybe people who are more transit captives were, um, had different levels of exposure and thereby showed higher infection and mortality rates that you capture by transit usage as a proxy? Yes, so of course, this is a proxy. Um, it's clear that we are including also a population density in the, in, the mo in the model to control for size of these local labor markets. And we also uh, provide a proxy of transit density. So the, um, approximating how many people uh, per square kilometer are using public transport. Uh, it's clear that um, just to avoid misunderstanding, we are not evaluating the effectiveness of restrictions on public transport in reducing COVID fatalities. We are analyzing if and how the pre-existing characteristics of, of, of the areas uh, were playing a role in spreading the disease. We, we found in this paper, consistently with other research, that commuting uh, is, a, is a driver. So basically more connected places are clearly more exposed to epidemic health shocks. However, we do not find that places where uh, transit were more widely used were more severely affected by the disease. So it's clear that we are not able to, to evaluate the effectiveness of restrictions on public transport, mm -hmm. so far at least. Very interesting. Brenda, you also typed a question. Would you, would you like to read it out loud? Okay, um, I'm wondering what type of campaign would panelists recommend for encouraging people back on uh, to public transport or public transit? Well, it's an interesting question. Honestly, uh, I don't know if I can give a proper answer. Uh, it, clearly, uh, public transport being severely affected by many restrictions, and there are some papers that are saying, okay, uh, Restriction on public transport are not effective um, be just because with school closures and workplace closures, people are there are just less people going around because we have an increase in smart working. So, uh, too many restrictions on public transport are probably, um, I mean, over overwhelmed. So it's it seems that. Uh, people can go uh, safely on public transportation because there are less people on board. So we are avoiding congestion. Uh, but in terms of campaign, uh, I don't know what, what, what we can do to uh, convince people to go back on, on public transport. And there are also three notes in the chat that people can read how we could encourage people to go back to the transit. Thank you very much, Mattia. That was Thank you. presentation. Very good. All right. And that brings us to the end of this workshop. So we had a full program today. And this was only the first part of this webinar. We are continuing with this webinar in two weeks. And that is on March 11th. We'll have a second block of presentations. And we were happy that we could get Rob Noland from Rutgers University to give a keynote address. And then we have three interesting blocks of presentations on telework, micromobility, and policy implications. So I guess one takeaway from the session today is that probably the million dollar question, a million euro question, or whatever currency you like, is how will travel behavior change and how will land use application change? once we leave COVID-19 behind us. And I thought we had very interesting presentations here that tried to touch on this. A lot of um, survey summaries we found, saw and how COVID-19 impacts travel behavior. And we saw the data from Madagascar, how in part it has recovered again. Um, we also saw how online shopping is affected and how people, how business owners might become more innovative by delivering goods and competing with the big stores. Um, but then we also saw things like impacts on auto ownership. And if we talk about telework, that might be easy to switch. If I telework this week, it's easy to go back to the office next week. But once I buy a car, that's probably more a long-term decision and might affect travel behavior 
more long-term, and then we had this very little discussion here towards the end, what might be the long-term implications on transit and how can we bring people back to transit? So I appreciate your contributions. Many thanks to the presenters who managed to give this information a very short amount of time, did a wonderful job here. And thanks to everyone for participating and asking questions and being here part of the discussion. Um, the discussion can continue on the Facebook website. And of course, you can also email the presenters. And we hope to see you all back here in two weeks on March 11th.